All right. Micromegas is a short philosophical tale by Voltaire. It's uh, Swiftian in uh, nature, but <coughs> so it's three beings of enormously different uh, sizes. The smallest ones are human beings, of course. Uh, the other two uh, have a long debate. It's impossible that being so small could have a soul, etc., etc. And they find out. They have a soul. This is, you know, the tale gave us really the title and uh, the idea, the coexistence of uh, extreme sizes uh, at once. And to give you a sense of what that may mean, this is uh, the last chart of uh, Mark Joker's microanalysis. It is a chart that he obviously liked, or in, and his publisher well enough to also put it on the cover of the book. This is a chart which consists of 3,000 nodes. Each node is a novel, and there are 165,000 links between these nodes established on the basis of about 600 distinct features. And uh, the nodes are virtually invisible. The threads are so small, they're also virtually invisible. But there is so many of them that this generates this really big cloud. And uh, you know, there is an unusual amount of information here compared to the kind of charts uh, we are used to do. But I think that the important thing this coexistence of very small units adding up to a very large system. System is not the right word for this, but to a very large entity. So to speak. This is really uh, um, widespread in digital humanities, and even here at the Literary Lab, a short self referential moment, just about all the things we do end up in one version or another of this state of affairs. This is a diagram of one of our research projects, uh, Mark and Ryan and several grad students. And it's built on four very simple variables, whether the rhythm of a poem rises or falls, and whether <coughs> the, the, the feet are three or two syllables. Four very simple, very small variables, potentially already thousands, potentially millions of English poems can be charted mm. on this uh, uh, diagram. Or, different visualization. This is yet another project on Canon and Archive. In this case, the unit are bigrams, two consecutive words. And on the basis of their repetition or not, this chart has been generated, which, uh, uh, as you can see, achieves an amazing capacity to distinguish be between texts that are usually considered canonical and texts that are uh, usually considered not. And this you know, eventually has been used for a uh, chart of 3,000 So, uh, and uh, you know, in my initial thinking about this conference, I had uh, an enormous list of examples from our own work, from other people's work. And uh, I'm sure you have in your mind many, many such examples. The logic is different. The units are different. The genres are different. The visualization. Are, but this coexistence of the very small and the very large remains. This has really become the signature, or certainly one of the signatures, the most visible of the digital humanities approach to the study of culture and of literature. This is why we devoted this conference to this uh, specific topic. And uh, this is not just a signature of an approach. It has also been the sign of a profound, uh, well, uh, sure how to put it, but a, a profound novelty, disagreement, criticism that uh, digital humanities has introduced into literary studies. That is to say, it has dramatically uh, uh, foreground the relevance of scale in the study of literature. Dramatically, because the DH approach has clearly always privileged the extremes of the scale, whereas a long and, in many ways, very interesting and intelligent tradition of literary study has always privileged the middle of the scale. Typically, the middle as the text, <coughs> or as an exit, or as a scene, or as lines to be remembered, as a quotation, as an allusion. Again, examples can be multiplied, but they all belong to that middle sphere of analysis. 
a middle scale, a scale that I think it's, it's one in which readers are really the measure of things. It's probably been selected by our profession a long time ago because it agrees, uh, it, it seems to me, it agrees so well with our capacity to remember, to evaluate, to judge, to retell. Readers as the measure of things. And, uh, you know, so much so that, you know, the middle scale was perceived as being so natural that it was never even conceptualized as a scale. It seemed to be, to go, to be something that goes without saying. It has gone without saying for a long time, but clearly not any longer. The age has broken the detent between close and cultural critical reading. This is Alan Liu in his essay on his, where is cultural criticism in the digital humanities. And it has broken this detent by focusing on micro-level linguistic features that map directly over macro-level phenomena. Exactly what? And so the question becomes, fine. So we focus on the extreme of the scales, and we've bypassed them all. And what does studying literature mean when you make this choice? What does literature become once you bypass that middle of the scale? What does our object become? As you can see, it's a radical question both about the object of our work and about the techniques with which we go about doing it. This is why we're all here, <laughs> to discuss uh, this matter. And uh, uh, what allowed us to be here, this is usually a litany of thanks to institutions, departments, etc. My life is made very simple. There is only one entity that I have to thank for having been able to organize this conference, it's a Swedish foundation, the Wallenberg Foundation, uh, Wallenberg, as it's also known uh, in this country, that uh, research in uh, computerized uh, textual analysis in the middle of Silicon Valley should be funded by Sweden. Uh, it's something that I leave to your uh, uh, reflection. It's a fact in the Wallenberg Foundation as really are enormous They provided the uh, way we got to do this, but then uh, those uh, human beings are actually uh, are going to provide the content, the reality of today. Let me do a single big introduction and beginning with uh, our discussants. Uh, the discussants, many of them have uh, had uh, uh, much to do with the Literary Lab, beginning, of course, with Matt Jokers, who founded the Literary Lab with me just about five years ago in a much smaller, sort of, uh, a much smaller uh, environment, a much less crowded environment, and uh, eventually Matt has since moved on to found a second Literary Lab in Nebraska and do all sorts of work that the first image of the first uh, uh, speech at this conference comes from this book is a sign of uh, this book. Sarah Allison was one of the students who was with the lab uh, throughout the inception, from before the lab was uh, founded. And uh, uh, she was one of the people who worked at our first research project with a little help from the alphabet. She also turned out to be the first author in the first uh, project. Has uh, since been dethroned by an algae unit. Um, I'm sure that uh, you know, some Agamben or <laughs> eventually. Um, and uh, she's now uh, working on these issues and others in Louisiana. Natalie Phillips also was a student here. She was interested in a different type of uh, uh, lab. I still uh, remember the <laughs> night that, thanks to a couple of accomplices of hers, we snuck into a, an fMRI center here at Stanford to figure out whether a certain experiment uh, 
could be uh, run. She has since earned the right to enter these kind of labs uh, uh, without having to hide or to you know, be, uh, you know, in the pit of night and has done amazing research, which she has presented here at the literary lab, more in the direction of the neurosciences, but clearly the intersection between the digital humanities, as we will present mostly here today, and neuroscience is one of the great frontiers of our work for the years to come. Andrew Goldstone was not theorist. He was a postdoc, and uh, he was often uh, present at our meetings, fearlessly asking the most polemical question when we invited the uh, culturomics uh, uh, pair of uh, uh, Michel and Lieberman to present uh, here, and always uh, been an incredibly engaging presence uh, at our meetings. He has since uh, produced uh, um, uh, an amazing uh, sort of uh, self-reflective uh, with Ted Underwood uh, um, essay on uh, Topic modeling the history of literary criticism in the 20th century, uh, which is something we may uh, end up discussing here today or in uh, the near future. Patrick Svensson uh, has, <coughs> is not at Stanford, but uh, uh, it's as if because <laughs> he's often here thanks to a, a, a really energizing, uh, how are these things called, synergy, which has been established between the the place he has directed for many years in Umeå University in Sweden, where he's created an environment for digital research, which is uh, uh, for, for both its technology and its human uh, uh, richness, the uh, uh, envy of us all. And he's always, he's often here and always it's very, cool. very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so far, this is a list of. Uh, you know, uh, fellow travelers, uh, friends, accomplices, etc., etc. But uh, the discussions uh, are, uh, are we also figure out that you know it's too, too much proximity is not good for discussions, and so we also decided to invite uh, uh, a couple of people, Eric Hayot and Joseph Lavery, who uh, don't really work in the digital humanities. Um, we invited them because they both, though they don't work, they both have uh, uh, shown in their work of recent years a great interest in whatever seems to be new, potentially interesting in the field of literary theory, uh, but without ever being you know, too indulgent with them. <laughs> so uh, in a sense, a mix of uh, criticism and sympathy, which I think a new field has to engage with, especially if it wants to really engage the already existing field. Finally, all the people I've been describing so far work with literature, but Sripad uh, Tujapurkar uh, does not. He's a biologist, and uh, if we wanted to have sympathetic critics from within the field of literary criticism, we also wanted very much to have uh, a, a critic, sympathetic, from the field of the sciences uh, as a whole. Of course, digital humanities has interacted a lot with computer science, but you know, uh, interaction with the scientific mentality, method, approach, more at large, is, uh, uh, I think, going to be extremely important if, uh, uh, if this field is, uh, is going to achieve its full potential. You may have noticed I've uh, described these eight discussions as uh, a loose group. They will not be tied to specific papers. They, as in an avant-garde play, they're sitting in the audience. You don't know who they are. And uh, they may stand up at a certain point and speak or not. They have neither more duties nor more rights than anyone else in this audience. We just invited them because we'd be interested to hear what they have to say. They, if they feel that silence is the best response, <laughs> <laughs> that is perfectly uh, uh, <coughs> Respondents, and then there are the speakers. Um, let me begin with uh, uh, the speakers in the afternoon. The morning is going to be the more specific uh, 
moment of the conference, the afternoon is going to be a slightly broader uh, uh, canvas, or actually very broader canvas. It's going to be de devoted to uh, linguistics and to topic modern linguistics, first of all. But 30 years ago, in an extravagant act of disciplinary self-destruction, English departments decided that they want to do break their ties with the linguistics, which have been very important in the previous 20 years. I think nothing good uh, followed from that. The decision wasn't the decision, it was just something happened. Um, one of the most interesting discoveries for me, and I believe many of us, in starting to work on uh, uh, with these new approaches, has been being forced to study linguistics again and to learn from linguistics and discovering how much we have to learn from linguistics and for the type of work we do. No branch of linguistics has proven more important than corpus linguistics. Susan Conrad is indeed one of the great corpus linguists of this uh, country and uh, she has done uh, work and one of her uh, um, it was a collective work, the Longman Grammar of Spoken and Written English. I mean, if uh, uh, there is a book that we need, we return to all the time, that's it's a masterpiece of uh, the combination of systematic thinking and actual telling you what goes on in the real world, which is a combination which should be the scholarly achievement, but it's so hard to achieve both. So Susan will. Uh, talk about uh, how this problematic presents itself within corpus linguistics. David Mimno will talk about topic modeling. Topic modeling has become the uh, uh, perhaps the most recognizable technique uh, of digital humanities. Controversial, as uh, uh, all <coughs> important techniques ought to be. David has been one of the people who most has contributed to shaping topic modeling and uh, making it what uh, it is. And uh, you will uh, see his scholarly uh, persona in a few hours. I want to add that in a field, one of the things that I enormously like about him, in a field like this one, which has a certain inclination to be in to promise the moon and to be asked to promise the moon uh, because of the grand system and all of these things. Promise me the moon, a little more than the moon, a little faster, not in 20 words, in 10. Well, David, you will see, is a model of understatement, sobriety, modesty. Not intellectual modesty, it's not intellectually modest at all when it comes to ideas, but modesty in, in the present year. And I think, as I said, uh, uh, there is a behavioral uh, uh, drift in this field, he counteracts it in a way that I find enormously refreshing. <laughs> Morning. The uh, second talk will be by Mark, Aji Hewitt, Ryan Heuser, and myself, not myself. They will be the only two at work, but they will be the only two uh, presenting it. Mark is the first person to be hired at Stanford in digital humanities, very big deal. He is uh, in the English department. He wasn't even a hire in the English department. He was what now universities call competitive hires, so all of the literatures and so on. He won the competition as a prize for winning the competition. He now runs the literary lab uh, with uh, uh, Ryan Heuser and uh, uh, myself. Ryan is, at this point, along with me, the element of tradition and <laughs> continuity, I'm afraid, even though he's uh, much, much younger, much too young for being, you know, the representative of tradition. But he has been with the lab longer than anyone else uh, in many different capacities. But uh, he has changed, uh, uh, you know, what he was uh, when he was not at the lab. But uh, he has always been there with uh, and has always given this amazing combination of intelligence and generosity, too much generosity, which has made him a darling. <laughs> Finally, firstly, in fact, 
Ted Underwood, I mentioned him already for writing with uh, Andrew this, uh, among other things, this uh, essay on the topic model in the language of literary criticism. Uh, here in the lab, he has, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we decided to start a little series of talks entitled So What? That is to say, okay, we've done a lot of work, we've found a lot of things, and now, uh, what changes? What, what, what has happened, really? And when we decided to start the series, well, I to pick one person, and we picked him. You know, so he came here and bravely uh, answered uh, the questions. Then, a year later, we decided to have our first conference, and fine, uh, uh, who's going to be the first speaker? The first speaker is going to be So, uh, he's probably wondering what is the next uh, uh, idea that we're going to have for which we will have to be icebreaker, but again, the fact that whenever we think of something, we think of him as being the first one to, uh, uh, to open uh, the issue uh, shows how we think. And having said this, oh, there's one last thing that I have to say. There are some grad students from Santa Barbara and more extravagantly from Exeter in Britain and from Tartu in Estonia. The fact that young kids with little money would spend their time to be here thinking that they have something to learn, this is what we live for. So they are, I'm very thankful to the speakers, to the respondents, but <laughs> forgive me, I am even more thankful yeah. to these uh, uh, guys, many of whom I don't even know. And this, this is it. <laughs>